1,000, 800 to 1,000 students. And he is a big advocate on our campus for active learning in large classrooms. So in these videos, he talks about how he manages to do this in large class settings. So the, our first example was a really complex one, as you saw, we talked about online modules, micro-teaching, multiple groups. So we wanted to show you an example that's fairly simple and straightforward, a more traditional flipped example. So in the same course, um, we use a method called the jigsaw reading activity um, to engage students with um, ideas that lead to a project where they create a vision of a university for 2050. How many of you are familiar with the jigsaw as an active learning method? Educational developer colleagues, yeah. So the essence of a jigsaw is that, let's say if I put students into five groups, each group engages with a different set of readings, and they become an expert on that topic. When they come to class, first they have a group discussion where they share ideas from their readings to make sure if not everybody's done their readings. They are, they are comfortable with the ideas for their expert group. And then we create mixed groups. One student from each of the theme areas joins the, joins the new group. So they bring different perspectives into that conversation and then we give them a task, something to create in class. The reason why I like the jigsaw is that really puts a lot of responsibility on the students. They can't not do the reading. They're responsible for the perspectives from, from the work they've done before class. It models the type of group engagement and group collaboration that they need to talk about when they apply for jobs after graduation. Um, and we talk to them about the meta level transferable skills they're gaining, gaining from group work. So uh, by the University of 2050, our students really love this activity. They read about curriculum theory. They le learn about the history of the university system. They look at mission statements of different institutions and explore different types of institutions from small liberal arts schools to large universities, um, private colleges, ones that use the block curriculum system and focus on one topic for three weeks, for example. And so, when they come back, they have a discussion in class, first in their expert groups, then in their mixed groups, and their task is to create a model for a university of 2050. They have lots of fun with this. They come up with unique names. We've had very uh, completely online uh, institutions they have designed. We have for-profit universities, very similar to uh, Kaplan University or the University of Phoenix, that are profit-making institutions, because we look at the financial models of schools. We have ones that are small, hands-on, face-to-face, liberal arts types of institutions where students engage in interdisciplinary learning. It's really wonderful to see the creativity blossom in this activity, but it's fairly simple. So what I wanted to emphasize here is that in a flipped classroom, not every student <coughs> needs to be exposed to the same knowledge before class. You can have them do research and find resources on climate change from each different continent and bring it to class and be responsible for sharing that. And that allows your class to have multiple perspectives inform student engagement in the group discussion uh, once when they are participating in active learning in class. This has been done in an engineering course at Western. Uh, where the faculty member got students to do research in, in, in languages they spoke and bring resources to class, for example. Right? So it doesn't have to be instructor-created material, it could be the freedom of searching for information that's available and practicing research skills. Um, the, second, um, the second activity that we engage our students in um, looks at changing educational paradigms and the goals of higher education. So, um, I'm going to show a little bit. So, one of the materials that we use online is an RSA animate video, and I probably need to mute it because it's very loud. Just play now, and I'll see. So, I mute it because it's a lot. So when we engage our students in conversation about changing educational paradigms, this is a really fantastic video with Sir Ken Robinson has given a number of TED Talks. How many of you have seen this one? Lots, of, a few people. So again, we expose our students who are going to be future faculty 
um, to this very thought-provoking 11-minute video on the purpose of higher education and how education is changing, why we educate students in batches by age rather than by ability. Um, how are we recognizing needs for accommodation? It's really fun. He's, um, he, has, he engages them with a really fantastic sense of humor. And so when we get back to class, here's what we have students do um, with that. The next learning activity, and so they're responsible for watching it. Um, and we have a conversation about the purpose of university education. Again, coming from different disciplines, we're trying to draw on the diverse disciplinary backgrounds of our students. We have students from professional schools who are going to teach in business school, engineering, dentistry, and we have students who are going to be faculty members in arts and humanities and promote critical thinking, citizenship. And so we want to bring those perspectives to the dialogue. So in class, they have a conversation about the purpose of the university and how it's changing, how it's changed from since the University of Bologna. And then we want to draw on the resources in class. So typically, about 50% of the students in our section are international students. Our international grad students are often in, interested in future faculty careers and they're very engaged in faculty development. So we wanted to use their knowledge and wisdom to educate our local students about education around the world. So we use a human library activity to accomplish that. How many of you have heard of a human library approach? One. Great. <laughs> So human library is a, is a documented approach to promoting diverse perspectives where um, if, sorry, if I want to learn about um, what it's like to teach or, and learn at a, China, at a Hong Kong university, I could decide that Paula is going to be my book. I'm going to check her out of the library, I'm, I'm out of my human library for 20 minutes and sit down with her and ask her questions about that experience. Um, there are guidelines that students receive on how to treat their book respectfully, <laughs> take care of it, return it in mint condition. Um, and they learn how to ask good questions. They also learn to listen. They also listen to someone's experience and, and then they have an assignment where they synthesize that. So in our human library, we ask students to, ask, to talk to their colleagues about what education was like in the cultures around the world where they grew up. So we had students from Ghana, from Nigeria, where um, it, a teacher never says, I don't know. Whereas in the Canadian classroom, if you ask the prof a question and they're not sure, they say, I don't know, let's look it up. And our Persian and Ghanaian students were completely shocked that in this low power distance setting in Canada, that was possible. Many of our students come from really teacher-centered cultures, fairly similar to the Hong Kong context, um, where students would not disagree with the professor. There would be more teacher-centered approaches. And so the Canadian classroom was very new to them. Their first day of class, we said, let's have a debate. What about your opinion? And, and why don't you disagree and have a, a debate or a role play? And so it was a great opportunity for our local students to understand the educational assumptions that our international colleagues brought into the classroom. The, so if you're curious about the human library, it's, um, there's a website, it's fairly well documented. Um, a lot of their work focusing on engaging students with things like understanding homelessness, understanding what it's like to be an immigrant or a refugee, what it's like to speak another language, be um, following another faith than you do, and asking respectful questions. It's a contribution to democratic citizenship in many ways. So you could use it in an anthropology class, um, an intro humanities class to understand perspective taking. And so not only, in, there's many ways to use human library in a flipped approach, in really exciting ways. You have students on campus um, who work in interdisciplinary settings and could interview each other to understand the other discipline that they're working with. It's been used all around the world. This is a map of where human library has been tried out. So it's very, very common um, and a really exciting method that I, I like because as a qualitative researcher, I really believe in the power of the face-to-face the -face interview and understanding someone's story. <clears throat> 
The next assignment, uh, I wanted to share with you another method we use in the in the face-to-face -face component of flipping this class. It's called the World Cafe method. We use World Cafe um, in our session on academic and academic integrity and ethics. So basically. Um, Students learn about principles of academic integrity and ethics before class. They look at some policy documents um, and some articles and research. Then they come to class and engage in the academic integrity and ethics cafe. We choose recent case studies from ethical challenges in higher education, often ones that have gone through our Senate Review Board academic recently, or we know them from colleagues at nearby institutions. Um, and so there's a World Cafe discussion after which students apply the knowledge they've gained in uh, the capstone in the courses designing their own course in the discipline that's got to be original. So then after the discussion, they write their academic integrity policy for their own course. They're thinking about how they're going to promote it among their own students when they teach. Um, but World Cafe is essentially a method could be a, a two or three hour session or a whole day where we create a cafe atmosphere um, and we engage in dialogue um, with guiding questions that go increasingly deeper on the same topic. So we'll start with a, an opening question, a 20 minute round. At each table, there's someone who's a table host, but everyone's invited to doodle, write, take notes and draw and document the conversation. Then after 20 minutes, everyone gets up, moves to another table, they get mixed up, talk with others. The table host remains at the table and documents the conversation, shares what's been said before. We have used this very successfully for community events, focusing on things like the experience of women in academia, um, challenges faculty members face in their classroom, discussions about graduate supervision, or about active learning. So it's, great, it's a great way to explore ideas. It's a long brainstorm, but often by the third round of questions as we're deepening the guiding questions, uh, we often ask our participants for some sort of, let's say, policy recommendations for the institution. So it's a great way to facilitate that one. And it's very well documented. So if you go to their website, theworldcafe.com, the world there's a hosting guide with handouts that you can give to the table hosts. It describes the method step by step. So again, once if you're flipping, you don't have to use World Cafe all the time, but in a one-year course, one session can be a World Cafe, and another session can be a different active learning format. It might be the worldcafe.com or .org. It's .com. I looked at the question. Yes. I think if I went to .org, it would be directed. Oh, it did. Okay. It will. You'll find it. It's. I think uh, I did link it from the slide. Actually, if you just click on the slide, it will take you. I should back to you. So one of the things that I that I do often in my classes is that I teach really sensitive, challenging material, so challenging for students. Examples of this are that I teach about immigration, I teach about refugees, I teach about colonization. Uh, Nanda and I are intercultural scholars. We do a lot of work with students and participants on having them reflect on their own cultural identity. And and discuss and think about and reflect on their transitions to new cultural settings. And so in this work, we, when we flip or when we blend those types of learning environments, we had, Nanda and I, when we started to do this work in flipped and blended environments, we had a lot of questions about how do we do this ethically? How do we do this responsibly so that students feel safe and that students feel supported um, as they would when we do it in face-to-face -face settings? face-to-face -face settings, we offer a lot of support in the way that we sequence these learning opportunities for students. So we wanted, in today's conversation about, and thinking through what to include online, what to include face-to-face, -face, we wanted to offer an example, example from our practice of how we blend and flip sensitive material. So one example is in this same graduate level course, the Theory of Practice of University Teaching, Nanda and I created a on, fully online module called The Globalization of Learning, and it talks about the interculturalization and internationalization of higher education. And in this module, Nanda and I acknowledged that this can't be done actually fully online. 
it is preferable if it is done in a blended environment. And so one of the things that we did, this is a screenshot of the four sections that are included in the online module, which you can also have a look at at the bit.ly teaching higher ed link. So with this online module comes a facilitator's guide. So if instructors are interested in including this module in their courses, there is a, a facilitator's guide that offers ideas and examples of things instructors should look out for and things instructors might want to include in their class to support student learning when we are speaking of such challenging and sensitive material. So in our class, here's how we approach it. The module offers a really good opportunity for students to be introduced to theories of globalization, theories of intercultural education, and it offers a lot of examples for students. So it is an excellent opportunity for students to become introduced to these ideas. But we also know that we can't go very deep into the topic in the online setting. So in the face-to-face -face session is where Nanda and I do a lot of experiential learning activities with students. So we play a lot of activities, there are some games, and we go through really uh, deep and complex case studies in that face-to-face -face environment. We also offer, offer opportunities for students to take that learning outside of the classroom and to continue to reflect on it in, as in um, asynchronous uh, opportunities, such as we have students take their course outlines our graduate students take course outlines that they're working on and do an activity that we call Walk With My Students where they look at the course outline from the perspective of a diverse student body and ask themselves, does my course offer opportunities for success for multiple students on campus? So here's a screenshot of the facilitator's guide. And again, this acknowledges that when we teach sensitive material in the classroom, it engages students in affective and cognitive uh, challenges. So it's emotionally challenging for students sometimes, and the, the ideas can also be cognitively challenging for students. When we're thinking of flipping sensitive material, Nanda and I were thinking about it in terms of if you look at learning, as engaging students in affective, behavioral, and cognitive realms, then the affective and cognitive can be very challenging for our students in, when it comes to sensitive material. Affective and behavioral. Sorry, affective and The cognitive is too, because um, in intercultural learning, we're asking students to demonstrate openness to difference. And so sometimes that is challenging too. They have to challenge assumptions they've been making for many years of their lives. But in intercultural learning, there are a couple of ethical principles that we are very mindful of and try to uphold. And that's the ethics of cultural learning and the ethics of culture contact. Basically, when we talk about cultural difference and describe groups of individuals, compare our uh, Canadian students, for example, with students from uh, from the global south or teachers from these cultures, we're very careful not to create stereotypes. We have to make sure that our learning materials emphasize the diversity of uh, perspectives, recognize individual uh, differences, and are very respectful. So we're super careful because it can go wrong in many ways. And many of you who might teach in philosophy or you teach ethics, you teach anthropology, sociology, political science political science where you're talking about conflict in class. The students in your class might have had a traumatic experience. They might be survivors of war. They have been refugees themselves. They've experienced violence in their lives. They've had mental health issues. As an instructor, you have to be super careful in how you facilitate learning about those topics. And so Aisha will explain how we're arguing that when affective and behavioral learning are involved, that the instructors observation and support of the students is tremendously important. So one thing that we've tried here is that when it comes to talking about theory, talking about examples, talking about case studies, showing videos, or having students reflect on their experiences, it's okay to do this when it comes to cognitive uh, levels online <coughs> 
as long as the learning that we're asking students to engage in doesn't fall too far outside of their level of comfort and their level of developmental um, learning. So it, it's fine to use these as long as it doesn't fall, as long as it's not going to be too challenging for students. Where I would caution against it is when it becomes very affective or behavioral, such as those experiential learning activities, or any activities, case studies, reflections, that students are going to find challenging without your support to guide them and walk them through. So let me give you an example of this. In our module, that globalization of learning module, we teach students about communication styles across cultures. So here's a screenshot showing the difference between linear and circular communication and direct and more indirect forms of communication. And we want students to reflect on this, think about where they might be along this continuum, and we want students to practice this and apply it a little bit. So to do this safely without engaging them in too high levels of affective learning, we offer small scenarios. So instead of offering a full length case study, which is what we do in class as a follow up to this, as the first introduction, here's a really brief case study. It's just about three sentences long. Students are given a scenario of a student and they're asked to think about do you think this particular individual in this scenario is demonstrating linear, indirect, informal, what kind of communication pattern do you think they're demonstrating? When students click on an answer in the module, so say I pick linear here and that's the wrong answer, a feedback will pop up for the student about why the scenario isn't showing, demonstrating linear communication. When students select the correct answer, they also get feedback about why it is correct. So if they're incorrect, they have to try again, mm -hmm. basically. We're not just giving them the answer. So I believe in the module you cannot progress until you answer the question correctly. Is that true? Did yes. I just that yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so before, uh, before we finish today, we actually wanted to give you an opportunity to think about flipped learning environments in your courses that you're teaching right now or will be teaching next term. I suppose at the end of the term, no one is teaching anymore. You're probably grading exams. Great chance uh, to redesign yeah. the next one. Exactly. You have three weeks to redesign your January <laughs> <laughs> course. Um, but no, this is an opportunity for us, because we're gathered together, to speak to other colleagues in the room and get feedback on, on sections of our courses that we could redesign. So if we could take five minutes, and here's what I'm hoping we can do. So in five minutes, chat with someone that you're, you're sitting next to and think about, just brainstorm at least a couple of topics or concepts that you're teaching in a course coming up right now that you think might do well in a blended or flipped approach. So remember, it doesn't have to have an online component, right? We've given many examples, such as World Cafe, Jigsaw, that would work well in a flipped, non-online format, or you can pick an online format. Now think about a couple of concepts that you think could be flipped or could be blended and chat to the person sitting next to you. And then we'll ask for a couple of examples and we'll, we'll have one more task for you after this. So make sure you come up with at least one concept that you could flip. Kind of meet someone you don't know already know very well. So turn to the person behind you, for example.
know that it works with everyone. By so my students told me that sorry, I think I don't My students told me that seeking the light is very high school, so I went earlier. <laughs> <laughs> but they both work. Flipping lights and clapping. So there was a great buzz going in the room. Can we ask a couple of participants to share an example of something of a concept or a topic that they might like to flip or blend in a course that they will be teaching? Is there a great example you heard yes, that you want to share? Yes, please. Okay. Oh, yeah, so um, maybe I'll be the first one. Then. Um, and nice to see you again. And nice to see you again. <laughs> yeah, we had a lot the other day. So. <laughs> um, because I'm not a Chinese Xi uh, person. I, I'm actually from back to Chinese I'm teaching. I'm teaching business ethics over there. And uh, in our current course component, oh, thank you very much. I don't have to yell. <laughs> uh, in our current course component, uh, probably half of the course will be covering some uh, philosophical concepts of moral reasoning, right? uh, uh, moral philosophy, that sort of thing. Uh, but the thing is, like those students are business students. They are not uh, students in philosophy. Uh, what it turns out that they don't seem to be really interested <laughs> and talk about well, philosophical concepts and frameworks and all those sort of things, but those are necessary things that need, needs to be covered. And it turns out that it's not really effective in using half of the class time just talking about frameworks and theories and things like that. So I'm actually thinking of applying the flipped classroom uh, framework or concept in my classes to say, for example, like maybe some of the philosophical concepts and theories and moral reasoning, those sort of things can be covered online where students can actually, and they are, actually it doesn't have to be taught by me online either because actually there are a lot of uh, online resources and materials talk about moral reasoning, yeah, and animations. Uh, so, so they can actually equip themselves with those frameworks and knowledge and philosophical theories themselves in their own time uh, with materials that is actually more interesting than listening to me talking. And then when we are in class, then we can actually ask the students to have more discussions to talk about you know, real life business ethical cases and issues that they find interesting and relevant to the profession. And then, so we can actually maximize and the use of the class of time for more reflective learning rather than just you know absorbing those theoretical concepts alone. And it makes the theory and the philosophy less dry because yeah, exactly. you're bringing it to life in the classroom. Yeah, exactly. And applying it to the types of things that they're interested in after graduation. Well, and one way to make sure that they have engaged with the material is to say, so after you discuss the case, write a reflection or an analysis and make sure you reference at least two of the five theories that you've learned about on your own. It's okay to make students responsible for stuff we didn't necessarily cover in class uh, to encourage self-directed learning. So if they, they have to bring that into the assessment afterwards, then it will be nicely woven together. And it would also be nice to include, an, I don't know whether that would be an assessment component or not, but like, like what you said, a little bit of reflective journal or something, every other class is. Uh, what have they learned, not just from the case, not just from the theory, but what have they learned from each other? Looking at the issue from another student's perspective, I think that would be the most valuable part of the flip classroom. Actually, our business school at Western, the Ivy Business School, is a completely flipped curriculum. They, they use the case, case method, yeah. so students are responsible for an extended case, let's say, about the Toyota Motor Company. They come into class, or about the 2008 uh, world market crash, they come into class, and then it's a two-hour discussion, and most of their grade is based on participation. Um, and they used it very, very successfully for very high levels of students. Yeah, so I've got three weeks to prepare. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it will be a fabulous course. Let us know how it goes. <laughs> Thank you. Does anybody else want to share an example? Hi, um, this is Kevin from the Hong Kong Polytechnic University. Uh, we've been doing this uh, flip unit for uh, a number of years and uh, I, I believe the reception is pretty good. Uh, we do uh, undergraduate level introductory psychology, just like Atkinson in, in Western Ontario. No, Western. Yeah. No Ontario anymore. In Ontario, yeah, that's right. <laughs> okay. 
um, formerly known as the University of Western Ontario, which is in it's still Eastern the official Ontario. Legal name of the university. Yeah. Um, anyway, um, in our course, uh, one of the driest units is to uh, to be delivered is usually considered a uh, unit on thinking and cognition. It's pretty dry. Decision making, heuristics, algorithm is dry as a martini. Right? So what we did, what we did is that what we did is that on decision making, uh, particularly on uh, based on the model by Kahneman on fast and slow thinking, uh, we let our students to do few experiments on campus. We show them uh, how we uh, make uh, bias to a more uh, irrational reasoning uh, pathways than the more meticulous and algorithmic ones by having them to replicate that game on campus and collect some data and have to tabulate their uh, results That's back amazing. for the entire class. Nice. And they are shown the, the uh, overall results, how they conform to what the theory would predict, and they get to harass the security guards. <laughs> I love it. Uh, if you like that, uh, Paul can show you our video. Uh, we shot a pretty nice video on, on the flip activities. Yeah, if you could make, is there a way to share it with this group perhaps? I'll leave it to uh, Dr. Paul and I'll post to, to coordinate it. Yeah. I would love to see, yeah. So did everybody hear the description? So students go conduct experiments, test the hypothesis, um, violate some rules across campus and then come back. I do this in my intercultural communication course when we learn about nonverbal behavior and eye contact. We were testing how long you have to make eye contact with someone and what the violation is before they look away. So I sent my students to go around campus and stare at people. <laughs> but I told them they can't get beat up. So um, everybody came back safe and sound. And they had a really good experimental test of, of our nonverbal behavior theories and then could write a paper about it. And they did it in Paris. It was lots of fun. Thank you for sharing that. What a great example. I'm looking forward to hearing yeah. more about it. So one of the things, as you take these ideas home and think about them, we are leaving you with uh, a bit of a, a worksheet, I guess, to, to think through some next steps in blending your course. So we talked about pre, the face-to-face, -face, the in-class, and the post. So looking at these three opportunities to enhance engagement in your course, using the ideas that you just shared with colleagues in the room, what activity or approach might you use uh, before the face-to-face -face session? What might you use in the face-to-face -face session? And then what opportunities are there to reflect and to debrief after the session that might be asynchronous or online? And for each of these, is there a tool or a technology that might help you enhance this activity or approach that you're thinking of taking in your particular class? So this is your post asynchronous <laughs> at the end of the day after our session. At the end of the day, you have to hand it in to Cecilia. <laughs> <laughs> Cecilia shaking her head no. <laughs> But we just wanted to show you um, a tool that could help you in finding the right tool. Our uh, e-learning team at Western has done a really amazing project where they have curated a number of e-learning tools and collected them on our website. So um, the e-learning team created a website called the e-learning toolkit where they have listed a number of different tools that help engage students online and in flipped formats. And then what I particularly love about the e-learning toolkit is that you can sort the tools not just by what they do, but what you'd like to achieve and how you'd like to engage students. So if you go to the section on achieving specific outcomes, there are outcomes for the professor and outcomes, what would you like your students to achieve? So you might say, I want them to think, perform procedures, demonstrate techniques, or I want them to solve problems and develop plans. And then you'll find a description of five or six e-learning tools that will help students engage with that kind of thinking online. So we'll leave you with this tool um, with, a, with great gratitude to our e-learning team who's done about six months work on, on organizing these for our faculty. And so they have used these tools in the blended redesigns we have shared with you today. Thank you so much for your questions, for participating. And um, good luck with your new designs. Let us know how they go. Thank you.
thank you, Dr. Demetrov and Ms. Huck, for this inspiring talk. Um, we, have, we now have time for a couple of questions from the floor. Is there any questions? Such a wonderful opportunity to hear all the examples and possibilities. I want to ask a question relating to the uh, jigsaw puzzle. Yes, uh, we've tried with different classes, and students know what to do with jigsaw. Uh, but very often you allocate specific sort of aspect that you want them to research on, and they become an expert on the area. But afterwards, it's as you invite them to go through to other groups and disseminate, so on and so forth. But the result wasn't as good as we would like to. That is, they don't really learn a lot from the rest because they are the expert on their own aspect and not their own area. Is there any solution that is that they can really broaden their mindset across the other areas rather than just focusing back on their own area? So that's the question that I is still unresolved in my, in my head. What we've tried, I've seen that challenge, certainly. We use this in another program as well. What we've tried to do is to create a collaborative learning task where they each had to contribute their area of knowledge and engage with the other areas in order to create what they're doing. So in, in designing the University of 2050, they do have to consider financial perspectives, curriculum perspectives, technology, sort of philosophies of education, um, how are they going, what, what's the mission of the school, so they can't do it without the others, so they have to ask questions and, and do it together, and through application they're engaging with the other areas. But what if they don't actually uh, engage, they just speak to us, they all speak uh, different topics and different uh, students, they don't get talking, they don't actually they, we ask them to, to like really write a mission statement for the university and they have to present it back to the rest of the class. So they're not just sitting there. Usually my method is not just having them sit and have a discussion, but have to produce something that creates knowledge for everyone else. And then, you know, they want to save face at least. <laughs> but, uh, but it's through application that they're learning it. I, mean, I can't force someone to learn if they don't want to. Usually what we do is we assign two students each. In each. So in a group you might have one person on each topic or you could have two and then they support each other. They remember different parts of the meetings that appear. Aisha, sorry, do you have anything else? No, that's great. And even just to make sure when they share back with the rest of the group to have a really concrete process in place when they're sharing back, so when they're presenting to the group, maybe there is a worksheet that the rest of them can fill out, or maybe there are specific questions that the rest of the group has to ask um, from each expert so that, they're, so that you can ensure that they're each gaining knowledge in all of the different areas. Well, or if you have a post assignment again where they have to incorporate what they learn into a paper they're writing individually, then they'll have to. Any more question? Um, I work with a lot of faculty and it's um, one faculty in particular wants to flip his classroom um, so that it's more field work based and then goes back to the theory. Um, he doesn't have any experience actually facilitating his use to lecture. So do you have any advice on how you can make a lecture into a facilitator? because the delivery is equally important as these ideas. May we offer up the teaching center at the university? <laughs> so there's, um, what you're describing is a big cognitive shift, right? Where the faculty member needs to switch. It's a paradigm shift from the teacher center, the teacher has knowledge, delivers information to students to I'm facilitating student learning, encouraging my students to think about the material. They learn from each other, not just from me. So the most effective way we found um, to do that is through um, micro-teaching. So our faculty participate in courses where they get to t practice teach for a few minutes. And we give them a list of active learning techniques and we have them try them out. They must do it in order to get the certificate in the course that they're taking with us. I'm sure that the, the center here or at your institution has lots of programs to promote active learning. There needs to be that shift. So 
Faculty find it useful when they see other colleagues in similar classes do it because they will say, well, you know, this might work in sociology, but in engineering, I have so much to cover. I have to tell them about everything, right? So content creep is a big barrier. Letting them know that students can learn something equally well by engaging it in other ways. In the module we've shown you, we've, we've cited a lot of research on active learning and the impact of active learning. So if they're able to shift to a student-centered approach, then providing them with evidence of how this will actually help their students do better. I often also say it reduces student complaints and increases success rates, right? It's better for you to use this approach. And the module that we shared with you also has lots of examples of activities because I find another barrier as you're making that paradigm cognitive shift is, well, what are some examples of what I can do in my class? So again, it's divided between large classes, small classes, individual, and also there's lots of examples from across the disciplines. Active learning is just so much more fun. <laughs> Thank you. Any more questions? Uh, thank you. So uh, I'm from the University of Hong Kong, so uh, e-learning support team. So just want to know uh, for implementing a large class, uh, large class free classroom. So do we encounter any difficulties or any tips or strategies to encounter maybe hundreds of flipping a class with hundreds of students or three or four hundred students? So the example we showed you from biology is a class with about a thousand four hundred students. There's, they're in two 800 student sections, so same idea, um, problem solving online and in class they work in groups, they work on problem solving. If you, uh, I would encourage you to look at the module and on the active learning module that we've shared with you, there's some videos where we recorded Tom talking about how he uses active learning with 800. He asks the students from this side of the class and that side of the class, you're responsible for getting the answer for different things, his classroom's a bus, but it requires a lot of very courageous in leader in the class to engage in hundred and active learning, but lots of people do it well, so. Do you have TAs in your class? Uh, yes, the idea of uh, talking about, uh, for, for example, a top law class would be about 300 students, mm -hmm. and then we have several TAs. So yeah. the involving, one of the things that Tom talked about in the course, especially as you're thinking of shifting uh, activities out of the classroom to help you prepare for that and to help prepare the students for that. Getting your TAs involved uh, will be really crucial. So yes. it's talking about 800 students, that means 800 students will be in a classroom or? Yes. Okay. Yes. 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 And then he, he, and he was talking about all of his TAs and how, how critical it was to involve them in the flipping experience because you will need help in creating the activities for the, the flipped um, environments, either if it's online or other types of like field exercises that we heard from, the, from here. So the TAs can help um, in terms of logistics, in terms of helping organize the activities, um, and then you know, discussing them with the students. And he does, so he does clickers, they do think fair share, they do exams where you, um, an exam where uh, you scratch off the answer, and if it's not the correct answer, you have a chance to consult with your group and choose a second answer, discuss, and earn extra credit on the exam. They do lots of problem solving, so with 800. So if you look at the module, there's videos under how to apply active learning in the classroom, and he talks about a lot of those. There's a lot of research, actually. So in whatever discipline you're teaching, and I'd encourage you to look at the educational journals. I mean, as an educational technologist, you have access to those and just see examples that colleagues have published and done research about. There's lots of research on teaching in psychology, biology, the, all the first year, te first year disciplines. There's been scholarship of teaching and learning um, work that happened on the impact of active learning and flipping in those classrooms. Thank you. Thank you for asking. Don't be very bad, or right behind you. My name is Bo, I'm a research staff at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Kind of going off of uh, Dan's question earlier, especially regarding space, I think you said you had one class of 800 students. In Hong Kong, that might be a very scary thought to find <laughs> space like that. So wondering if you have space 
constraints as well, and how do you deal with that? And if you do split up 800 students into multiple classrooms, how do you manage quality? How do you make sure they get a good experience if they're in smaller classrooms split up with, I don't know how many teachers that you do that with? So often the model that we have in really large classes like that, um, so in, in the videos that Nanda was, was saying in, in large class active learning, that, ha that does happen in the big class of 800 people. So there are faculty members who, many faculty members who are doing active learning with 800 people in the room. Um, but what also happens in those classes is that they break off and te teaching assistants, graduate students, um, take smaller sections, usually between 30 to 40 students. So they're not always just in the large class. There's also breakout sessions that happen each week with about 30 to max 50 students in the room. So that allows for, for deeper engagement and opportunities. But you asked about quality. So the 800 student or 1400 student class is a teaching team of six people who collaborate during the semester. So they have it's a learning community of faculty who work together and they have been doing it for a long time to make sure there's consistency. We do have space constraints. 800 right now is our largest classroom. We used to have 1,200 because it, but it was the basketball arena. So it required a lot of work for them to have the seating on the basketball field and they put extra chairs on the court. And there was a, like a catwalk where our psychology prof, Dr. Atkinson, would walk and present. So that was too much work for a physical class. So we built an 800 seat classroom. So those faculty members work very closely together to make sure it's the same quality. I mean, you have two sections. Every instructor is going to be a little bit different. It's not identical. Um, but, you know, students achieve the same learning outcomes um, as much as possible, right? And so the only time they're not all in the same room for the lecture is when they do exams because you need to have one person with a gap and one person with a gap when they're writing in exams and then they're spread out all across campus. But generally, um, I think Dr. Atkinson's guest lectured at the University of Dar es Salaam, Tanzania with 1,900 students and it was an outdoor classroom. That was pretty cool. Thank you for the questions and the answer. Um, may I have Professor Lam again to present souvenir to Dr. Dimitrov and Ms. Park on behalf of the event organizers?